You are listening to season four of the Bitcoin Takeover podcast, a 10 part series in which hardware wallet makers and breakers get interviewed. Before I introduce this episode's guests, let's hear a few words from the show's sponsors. LXMI is a European cryptocurrency exchange whose name is inspired by Lakshmi, the Hindu goddess of wealth, good fortune, and prosperity. It's one of the regulated and legal cryptocurrency exchanges. On LXMI, you can buy bitcoins with most fiat currencies, and you can also do trading with top altcoins. They follow the Not Your Keys, Not Your Bitcoins philosophy with their integrated non-custodial wallet, which helps you manage your own private keys. So if you're into trading, then you don't have to worry about having your crypto frozen by whatever political decisions, since you're empowered to hold and move your coins whenever you wish. It's great to have new players like LXMI that respect your financial sovereignty. LXMI is launching in 2020, and for more information, please check out lxmi.io. If you're not into trading, it's recommended to move your coins to a hardware wallet or some other form of cold storage, and in this episode, you're about to find out why. Please keep in mind that this is just an ad for a sponsor of the show. It's not meant to serve as financial advice, and you're responsible to do your own research before buying anything and act according to your own decisions. Embrace your financial sovereignty with agency and precaution. Femex is a Bitcoin exchange with derivative trading options, which focuses on speed, robustness, and maximum uptime. Built by former Morgan Stanley executives, it manages to bring simple and accessible Bitcoin trading. In 2020, Femex will also add S&P 500 stocks, stock indexes, Forex, commodities, and more. Sign up today at femex.com slash bonus and receive a bonus of up to $72. Please keep in mind that this is just an ad for a sponsor of the show. It's not meant to serve as financial advice. and You're responsible to do your own research before buying anything and act according to your own decisions. Embrace your financial sovereignty with agency and precaution. Hi there, and welcome to Season 4, Episode 7 of the Bitcoin Takeover Podcast. I am Vlad, and today my guest, and it's very hard for me to compute that I'm having this kind of high-profile guest, but it's Peter Todd, who is a cryptography consultant nowadays. He used to be a Bitcoin core developer, and if you look at the list of commits on GitHub, he is still one of the highest ranked in terms of activity. And nowadays, he works on different projects, and possibly he doesn't want me to mention that he has also worked on that privacy cryptocurrency, which, whatever, okay, he goes to conferences, he talks about dishonest developers and explains how ethically developers should conduct their activity and also he writes interesting stuff on twitter and part of the reason why he is here is because he commented on the treasure which got hacked very fast by the security team of kraken and that was quite a big debate on social media and people have started asking questions and Essentially, I guess the main idea is that we should not trust hardware wallets for their physical security, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I mean, I, I, I think like there's a range of threat models you might want to have, but you know, the most important thing about a hardware wallet is that it's not soft, you know, it's not a pile of software on a compromised computer, you know, not that like it's protecting you against ninjas who are you know breaking into your into your apartment. 
Uh, I guess the fault is, or maybe that we should blame the marketing departments for making some claims about what hardware wallets do. And I think one of the examples that comes to mind was one where one executive of a certain company said that you can basically buy one of their devices on eBay and it's still safe. Well, which one? Because uh, I think more than one company comes to mind there. <laughs> really? <laughs> the one with the secure chip. Which one? <laughs> See, I, I think you're thinking of Ledger, but I'm pretty sure they're not the only one who's made silly claims like that. Really? Yeah. I mean, I spoke to Jonas and Douglas of Shift Crypto. They do the Bitbox and they said it's a bad idea. And their perspective on hardware wallets is that they should be like toothbrushes. So you put them into your mouth and you move them back and forth <laughs> and uh, your teeth get clean? It depends. <laughs> that, that can be useful. They, they can be tasty sometimes. <laughs> So, see, I, I think the toothbrush brush analogy isn't necessarily so good because sharing your hardware wallet isn't necessarily so bad, but you really want to know where the hell you're buying it. Whereas I'll go buy a toothbrush just about anywhere where you fly. Yeah, that's a good point. And one of the biggest criticisms of hardware wallets is that they can be subjected to supply, supply chain attacks. Absolutely, yeah. And not just can be. I mean, we have concrete examples of this. Although the way that the um, attacks have gotten public publicity happen is hilariously simple, which is you go and take out the little uh, you know seed card that you're supposed to go right down your seed on, and then just go pre-fill it. And that's enough social engineering to go fool people into using that seed. So that worked, actually? It's yeah, no, cover. apparently people have fallen for this. I would have expected people to, you know, implant chips and tracking, what, what do you call it, RFID stuff. Well, you know, why bother doing something complex when a simple attack will work? That's a fair point. So do you personally use any hardware wallets? No, actually, I don't. Um, I mean, I own some, but I don't actually go use them. And, uh, you know, what I do instead is I just go run regular wallets on, you know, when I like when I need to, to securely store a fair amount of Bitcoin, I just go right, run a regular wallet on a computer that I don't use for anything else. Yeah, that's something that a lot of full time Bitcoiners say. And hardware wallets were not around until I think 2012, 2013. And yeah, re relatively recently, at least for uh, if you're an old timer. Yeah, <laughs> you have been around at least since 2001. And yeah, <laughs> it's interesting that nowadays owning a hardware wallet is part of becoming a Bitcoiner. They have turned it into some kind of lifestyle. And to some people, it's impossible to conceive that you withdraw your coins from an exchange where you buy them on anything else except for a hardware wallet. So my question to you is, how were you people dealing with Bitcoins in the early days? Well, you know, in the early days, like people didn't have that much money in Bitcoin. So, you know, the, all, all the standards are kind of very different. But I, I think the more interesting thing is like, well, what do you do these days? And first and foremost, I'll go point out, if you're withdrawing your Bitcoins from an exchange, how do you even know that the withdrawal happened? Like, wh where did you enter in the address to do the withdrawal? You know, you get all kinds of questions about this that can break your security long before it ever gets to the hardware wallet. Similarly, if you do have a hardware wallet, how is it exactly that you verify that there's Bitcoins on it? You know, the hardware wallet itself probably doesn't have a full node. No, obviously. Some of them yeah. allow you to connect to a full node. At which point, well, what security are you really getting over just running that full node on a separate computer by itself? That's also a fair point. Yeah. You know, like I, I personally, on my, you know, on essentially all my day-to-day um, -day use computers, I run cubes. So I have, you know, multiple independent virtual machines I can just go and spin up and 
they're all separated from each other and so on. So it's very easy for me, for instance, to run a Bitcoin node for a wallet and then, you know, have, say, a set, you know, have that virtual machine, say, connect to a separate node that can also run as a firewall. You know, there's many options there. Yeah, I mean, if you're able to do it, there's no reason to not do it because you you know exactly what's going on there and you understand security. Yeah. But what about somebody who has no idea what he's doing or she's doing and maybe just gets a hardware wallet? Do you have any kind of recommendations in regards to what they should be learning? Honestly, like the, the advice I've given, you know, I've like actually given people is just go and get like a, an iPhone from, you know, a somewhat reputable source that couldn't go and target you and just install a wallet on it. You know, or like get an Android phone, install wallet on it, and don't use the phone for anything else. I mean, that's actually not that crazy advice. You know, and if I am gonna, you know, tell them to go get a, a hardware wallet, I mean, frankly, I'd probably actually trust Trezor more because they do have a design that is based on you know more off the shelf chips than other people do. You know, and it's. Like the problem with something like a ledger is to get all these fancy security chips, you have to go sign NDAs. And then people can't easily reverse engineer your devices and figure out if they're actually doing what they should be doing. You know, you're actually putting much more trust into the manufacturer than you are on something like a Trezor or let alone something like a, you know, a phone. Yeah, but to people who have been holding their coins on Coinbase or Kraken or whatever, sometimes it seems natural that they have to trust somebody and they're going to say, okay, I'm going to trust this company that they will provide the security that they, they provide. And they seem to be also pretty high up uh, in terms of market ranking. I, I suppose Ledger is the best seller right now. So the, 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 well, for Remember the, the the economics of point is the economics of a hardware wallet is that they're selling a device that costs money, which then gives them the ability to go and pay for marketing and you know people to go sit on podcasts and all kinds of things. Like there's just there, you know that's that possible set of solutions is always going to have more support simply because they're the ones with the budget to actually go and you know, push their solution. I mean, it's kind of an unfortunate thing with regular wallets on software is that it's actually kind of hard to monetize them. Yeah. Also, I suppose there's a market for the data that gets generated when you're using a hardware wallet, which connects to the servers of the company. You're going to know your location, your email address, your IP, and Possibly you also connect to their full node and they're going to see all of your generated addresses and transaction history. Yep. And there's a market for yeah, that's, data. That's absolutely true. Although at least with a hardware wallet, there is a income stream in the form of the hardware. You know, other other than that. See, from that threat model, um, a pure software wallet's actually more worrying. Right? Because they don't have any other income stream. You know, with exceptions like, say, um, you know, Blockstream's uh, green, you know, um, green, green address slash green bits, where, you know, that's just sort of an add-on service to other things that they're making money off of. But, you know, if you're looking at a company whose only thing they're doing is creating a wallet, well, you got to ask, well, where's the money coming from to actually do that? Yeah, I think we should ask this with Electrum, which is one of the most popular wallets well, you, you know, the Electrum developers, I'm pretty confident, is just an open source project. But certainly the Electrum servers that people run, chances are a lot of them are run by chain analysis companies. You know, and Electrum's like model of having a bunch of sort of servers that you kind of pick at random where you're not, where you don't know who they are actually really worries me. I think you're much better off in a situation like that actually having very centralized, well known servers. You know, like, like this irony of it, like decentralization for privacy doesn't necessarily work because of uh, simple attacks. I never really thought about this, but it makes a lot of sense. 
Just like how he spoke with Nopara, who developed Wasabi Wallet, and he told me that Coinbase is actually a very good mixer. Well, depending on your threat model, he's not wrong. Right. You know, mo most exchanges that have hot wallets, they'll be very good mixers depending on your threat model. You know, if your threat model is, I don't want some, you know, guy off in Syria to go and be able to go figure out my, you know, what my Bitcoins are. Well, that guy off in Syria is subject to sanctions and probably won't be able to get chain analysis to go pick up the phone. On the other hand, if my threat model is someone who can get a chain analysis fee, well, chances are Coindesk is just dumping their database right off to chain analysis database. You know, I, I don't think they ever actually denied that. I think one of yeah, the obvious I, examples, and I'm sorry I cut you off. Well, you, you, uh, I, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I've seen evidence personally that chain analysis probably is getting feeds from, you know, various Bitcoin exchanges. You know, whether or not that's true now, it's it's really hard to know. But like it, it seems pretty damn likely to me based on the stuff I've seen. So. About hardware wallets, I've seen that Shapeshift is selling the Keep Key right now for about $20, and they even give it to you for $5 if you sign up to their exchange and your KYC, which is interesting <laughs> because this only proves that there's a market for your data and they can make enough money to sustain the operation, whereas the Keep Key used to cost about well, hang on. Whoa. two years ago. But why do you think that shows that there's a market for your data? I mean, why wouldn't that just be a marketing expense for Shapeshift? Well, I'm, that's a possibility. But you do sign up with your data. Well, sure. But I'm saying like Shapeshift probably would be doing this KYC no matter what, right? Point is, seeing the hardware wall get added onto that, I wouldn't necessarily read too much into it. You know, to me, that sounds like a marketing exercise, as in, you know, here's how you go and get onto cryptocurrencies and have some security. You know, I, I wouldn't jump to the conclusion of that being, uh, you know, that being malicious or anything. Having said that, I mean, depending on which servers your shapeshift keys go into, well, you know, they may be able to get more data out of it. But, you know, I'd want to actually go check details like that first. I think I read some comments on Twitter and somebody wanted to know if you are using a cold card and you said you're not using any hardware wallets. So would you please disappoint? <laughs> <laughs> well, again, like this one of those things where I have a cold card, I played with it, but you know, it's not what I'm, I'm using to go and uh, store the, you know, store my riches <laughs> to the extent I even have them. <laughs> but like, it's just, I'm just dubious about all these devices, to be honest with you. You know, it's, and, and again, that kind of come, comes out of the threat model. I'm not terribly worried about, or well, I shouldn't quite say I'm not worried at all, but rather, I think if someone gets to the point where they physically broken into my, you know, my apartment or, you know, my safes and stuff like that, and have physical access to my wallets, a hell of a lot of stuff has, you know, probably gone wrong, and they could probably go and, uh, you know, get my bitcoins another way. Like once someone, you know, breaks into your apartment, they can also go, you know, leave hidden cameras as an example. You know, they can go and try to go get your uh, seed, you know, backup seeds in other ways. Like it's just, it, it just doesn't seem to me to be the threat I'm that, you know, that worried about compared to the much more benign threat of, well, you get some malicious software on the same device that. You know, you have, uh, you know, you have your wallet on. Similarly, remember that the way you interact with all these wallets is not purely through the wallet. Like, where do you get the Bitcoin address to actually send coins to? You know, that comes off a device that can also be compromised. Yeah, and sometimes these hardware wallets don't even have large enough screens to fit that whole address, so you can check it. Yeah. Exactly. And some people... You know, there's lots of issues like that. The display can be compromised if it's not connected to the secure element or something. Yep. Well, like um, Ledger, as an example, has this issue 
And it's sort of like doubly glaring with Ledger because, of course, they have marketed before saying, well, it's okay that they go ship their devices without any tamper-resistant packaging. You know, no tamper evidence at all. And that's just crazy because anyone can go take a Ledger, take it out of its box, pop the case off, and do whatever they want with it. You know, it doesn't matter that the key is are in little secure element. All your way of interacting with the device is insecure. I mean, ironically, with that regard, Tracer is better because at least it's, uh, um, you know, like a sealed case. That's, um, I think, ultrasonic welded, if I remember correctly. You know, same thing with cold card. They um, ultrasonic weld their cases. So it'd be quite a lot of work to take a cold card and, you know, tamper with it, then go put it back together. You'd have to invest in a bunch of tooling and stuff. On the other hand, by the time, you know, you're intercepting packages, you know, to screw with cold cards, well, maybe making a new ultrasonic welded case isn't actually that expensive. Yeah, also cold card does something interesting with marking a number on the packaging. So when you open it up, you see that number. And when you boot up the device for the first time, it asks you to verify if the number on the screen corresponds with the one on the packaging. But you realize how silly that is. Like you're, you're verifying it against the device. It could have been compromised by the attacker. You know, that doesn't actually work. Yeah, possibly. You know, the, the way you would you do that, that would actually work, is to verify a number against a signature checked by, say, your computer after, you know, hooking up to the cold, card, cold, cold card. But if you're going to have a system that actually works, that needs to be the default users do. Just having people check a number on the packaging to a number on on the chip is totally meaningless. I've also played with the latest cold card, the Mark III. And what's different about it is that it uses PSBT. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, um, uh, I think the, the acronym the stands for again. Partially signed Bitcoin transactions, I think. Yeah, so like that's a multi-sig situation, which does change things. Yeah, I mean, it's different in the sense that you can just connect the cold card to a power supply and you never connect it to your computer, but you do have to save to back up your data on an SD card and then put your SD card inside the computer. Well, let's be clear. You are connecting it to your computer. You're just doing it through a higher latency way. Yeah. You know, like the thing is the, the physical wire is connecting it to your computer. They're not the thing I'm worried about. Yeah, the thing I'm more worried about is the fact it's communicating to your computer at all. Because right? the most likely exploit you would get there would be, say, a bug in their transaction parsing code where you can go and, say, do a buffer overflow on the cold card. You know, and saying it's not connected to your computer doesn't, like, doesn't help that situation at all. You know, I'd be perfectly happy to have a cold card with a USB interface. Yeah, I think the the added security of the SD card isn't that much. Now, one thing you can do with an SD card, which is kind of nice, is you can go and um, you know, for really high security stuff, you can go audit it, right? Because the way the way you do that is you write to actually say two SD cards, right? And then you put one aside, use the other one to then do the communication. And now you have a record of what actually went into the device and can go and have some attempt of auditing it. But you'd really need on the cold card side, and I don't think their firmware does it, to have the option of writing the transaction to two separate SD cards as well. All right. Interesting. And just for the record, PSBT is BIP 174, because I know somebody will try to correct me, and I said 157. <laughs> yeah. I had to look it up. Well, like when I was involved in the Zcash trusted setup, um, there was that same kind of auditing consideration where we wanted to, or, you know, like the, the trusted setup um, scheme was designed to leave an audit trail of all the communication that actually happens with the compute nodes. And that audit trail was done in the form of burnt 
CD, you know, well, burnt DVDs. Although, again, you kind of had the same kind of problem where uh, people think uh, DVDs are um, uh, right once, and they're actually not. Because even if you close out the session, you can still, uh, you know, you can still modify the data on them at a low level. So in theory, it didn't actually go meet that requirement. But, you know, again, that's the that's idea. Leave that audit trail. Yeah. I was about to ask you, you said to, you recommend to people to just get a new phone that actually an old one that they can wipe and install some sort of wallet. But if you were to recommend just one hardware wallet, which one would it be? The Trezor? Probably, yeah. Because they're the ones whose overall design and marketing seems like the, le like the least uh, voodoo silliness. Yeah, you know, there's nothing about Trezor that makes me want to correct them. You know, like look at Ledger where the marketing of you can just go and get this without tamper, you know, resistant packaging is just wrong. Or, you know, cold card where this like setup, you know, initial number setup thing just doesn't make sense. Whereas Ledger, like there's nothing like that. I can go point and say, all right, that doesn't make sense. Ledger is a fairly straightforward design and, you know, it has its limitations, but I think from what I've seen, it's you know, reasonably well understood and I would trust it in the scenario where I wasn't expecting it to be physically secure, which I think is fine. You know, if you really want, like if you really want the physical security part of it, use a passphrase with it. Yeah, that, that's a fair criticism and I'm, I'm happy yeah. I got you because you are a big critic of the whole concept of hardware wallets, which is awesome. I got so much positive input in regards to how they work. And possibly I think when I first started doing this whole season, which is going to be 10 episodes, just about hardware wallets and cold storage, I thought I would make it easier for people to decide what they want to buy when they get a hardware wallet. But now I think I just made it a lot more difficult. <laughs> but that's for the better. Well, you know, and I think like what, what would make it even more difficult is having more hardware wallets um, support uh, PBSD and like also more um, software on the computer side as well. Because multi-sig does change things with this and it changes what you're actually using it for. Like when all the keys is in one place, you know, it's effectively like that's the security model you're kind of using. Whereas when things are multi-sig, you get much more nuanced control over what exactly your security model is. Also, I'd point out like there's a difference between um, security with the intent of avoiding loss and security with the intent of auditing and you know figuring out how you say lost something. You know, like in corporate environments, for instance, a lot of security is actually about auditing. You accept that someone might go break in, but you're much more concerned about understanding how the break in happens so you can go stop it next time. I've heard some people who say they store private keys on devices like the Ubico, which is a small flash drive, which stores any kind of passwords from email to whatever kind of accounts you might be having. And you just put it in your USB and I think it has some sort of fingerprint scanner. And that's how you authenticate with the device. You mean the YubiKey? YubiKey, yeah. Yeah, that's not, that's not where they are. Now, the, the YubiKey is um, effectively a smart card in a different form factor. And the password thing you're thinking of, I think, is uh, you're, you're more, well, like, first of all, the YubiKey can store a very limited number of passwords, which is sort of an older style authentication mechanism. But the thing that they're better, no, you know, that they're more used for these days is um, like FIDO and UTF, where on the UB key, there's an ECC key that then, similar to actually how Bitcoin addresses get derived in hierarchical wallets, um, you do a VCC math to then drive a key per particular website that then gets used to assign an, an authentication token. You know, so that acts as a second factor to your login. And you know, they're quite useful. I mean, I have one. It's sitting on my keychain right now. 
I kick actually probably five of them for various reasons, but the, 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 you know, I use one like day to day for login and I think they, they work great. But in the context of Bitcoin, like they don't understand the Bitcoin transaction. So all they're useful for there is auditing. Okay. So they're not friendly with people who are newbies and have no idea of what they're doing. No, I, I, I wouldn't say that. I'd say they're very friendly. It's just they offer very little security in the context of Bitcoin, right? Like, so they're, they're great for, say, you know, securing your Kraken account. And I do use YubiKey, um, you know, YubiKey to store the 2FA for my Kraken account. But they won't actually, like, because they don't have a u- user interface, they can't really help that much in protecting your actual Bitcoin, you know, putting a private key on a UB key for your Bitcoins doesn't really make that much sense. Yeah, I think there was somebody who was actually asking in regards to this idea that any kind of Bitcoins you're holding should be associated with, with a full node. And he asked if it's possible to set up a watch-only wallet with a pruned node for hardware wallets. No. I mean, I'm not too familiar with how much software exists for that, but certainly that's po- you know possible to do. Um, like Bitcoin Core is an example, it does have watch only f- um, features, so it's very easy to uh, at least you know at the API level to have watch only wallets on Bitcoin Core. You know, as an example, um, some of the CoinJoin wallets actually go use this, like Join Market. You know, that's just how they go and manage their wallets. Because the join market then keeps all of its private keys separately. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. I've also seen exchanges do this too, where um, like in their internal wallet implementation, you know, they'll you know, use this watch-only wallet by Bitcoin Core, but then do private key management in some totally other way, you know, like maybe an HSM or something. So what did you say to people who only use Bitcoin Core, which is essentially a hot wallet on a computer that's connected to the internet? Well, I mean, I'm not necessarily that worried about it. Like it's probably, you know, the the thing with Bitcoin Core is there's a ton of people looking at that code base and auditing it, which is one of the big worries I have actually about a lot of uh, hardware wallets, especially, um, you know, non-multisig ones. Where you got to ask, like, how many people are actually looking at that code base? You know, how many people are reviewing changes to, for instance, prevent mistakes? You know, we've had um, we've had people lose plenty of bitcoins just because their bitcoin wallet screwed up, and say sent bitcoins to an you know unspendable address or something like that. You know, that might actually be the bigger threat overall. So, you know, in that regard, like Bitcoin Core doesn't look so bad anymore. Also, again, you know, it's not that hot of a wallet if you do something like, say, run two Bitcoin Core nodes and then have one sort of firewalled by the other. You know, similarly, run your, like, if you have a wallet, good advice is run your Bitcoin Core node over Tor. So it's very difficult for anyone to actually go target you. Yeah, that's fair. And actually, I think next week or in two weeks, I'll be interviewing Slush. Oh, yeah. And his argument for using hardware wallets is that he has seen so many people lose their coins in the early days that it's just, to most people, it's just a lot more convenient to have one device where you store it and you have a piece of paper or possibly a metal plate where you engrave your seed words. Well, you, I mean, that, that argument isn't unique to hardware wallets. You know, like, I mean, just give an example. Of course, I, I use Eclair with uh, Lightning. And Eclair for the non-Lightning part does have a, a seed that you go right down. And that's exactly what I did when I set it up. That said, I mean, there's something to be said for the psychology of having a piece of hardware that you know to go keep safe. You know, that may be, you know, that may be something that helps some people. Okay. <laughs> you, you actually remind me about something I've heard from Douglas Backham from Bitbox when he said that a lot of the stuff going on with security in the hardware wallet space is just like 
theatrics. They're doing it just to make you feel safe, but in reality, it doesn't make much of a difference. Well, you know, you know like I say, the entire hardware wallet industry, it's kind of a weird one because it's a unique way to go make money by creating a wallet. You know, so right there, you're going to have more focus on hardware wallets than is probably actually strictly necessary just because it's a way to go make money. I mean, it's like the ICO market where everyone wants to go and create protocols that have tokens. Well, why did they do that? Because that's the only way to make money off creating new to- you know, new protocols. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a good idea. You know, and it's not to say it's never a good idea, but there's certainly going to be more focus on it than is really necessary. Yeah, that's a fair point. But there are, for example, there are some terrible cold storage solutions. Like, I'm not sure if you heard about the Belay. Belay. It's created by Bobby Lee. And it's like, it, it has the shape of a credit card. And it, it's basically just a card with a pre-printed private key. And he said, oh, yeah. just because it's yeah, printed, that's a- half of it is in China, the other half is printed in the United States. Yeah. You're supposed to... No, uh, uh, a particularly bad example that, that I saw was, um, I actually saw it at a conference recently, where some existing, like, you know, high-security government printer that would normally be printing, you know, say, you know, paper notes and so on, they decided to get into the Bitcoin business. And, of course, they did what they know, which was to go and pre-print private, you know, private keys on high security paper. Like you're basically better off just doing this by hand on your printer at home. But, you know, again, like this is driven by what they're able to do, regardless of how much sense it makes security wise. Similarly, um, if you want your really bad version of that, you go to uh, the bitaddress.org, you know, which uh, I don't know if they're still around, but it uh, was a, uh, you know, just a simple website with some JavaScript allegedly running where you'd go to it and print up private keys. Of course, if anyone goes and hacks into the server, they can do whatever they want with it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I remember this. You just run your mouse cursor around the screen and it's generally, it generates some... Kind of well, but, well, but see, you go, you go talk with the mouse cursor bit and that was probably the most secure part of it. Right, like you know, moving your mouse cursor around is probably a pretty decent way to go generate keys. That's not actually the issue. The issue is you're downloading source code every time you go to it off some not very secure server. Yeah, that's a fair criticism. I just generated a new key. I'm not particularly happy with this legacy address, but other than that. It was fun. It reminded me of what they did with the cold card that you get a dice and you roll a dice and input different values as many times as you want to generate more randomness. Yeah, I, I don't know. Randomness generation is another one of those things where there's so so much gimmicky stuff out there. Like in certain cases, for instance, generating them with you know dice and stuff like that can make sense, but only where people are actually auditing like how you know how these systems go work right and so, so like this came up again in the zcash trusted setup where what you'd like to do is have a system where you can audit the full chain of entropy input to public key output right so in that environment entering in some you know dice as an example can make sense because in theory, someone could go and generate a set of di- you know die numbers, enter them in, and then double check that the calculation was done correctly. Yeah, but that only makes sense if all that's documented and you know easy for someone to go replicate. I mean, security is uh, such a complex topic, and I think there are various stages in somebody's life when they discover something that's out there. I mean, in terms of threats and how to overcome them. And it's just like, I suppose, owning a house. At first, you don't worry much about what's going on and you say you're in a nice neighborhood. And then as time 
goes by, you see someone scratching your door and you're going to have to find ways to prevent something more severe from happening, right? And eventually start yelling at kids to get off my lawn. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I think that's <laughs> the most advanced stage of security when you don't trust anyone. Yeah, the, the get off my lawn stage. <laughs> and the NIMBY, not in my backyard. But, you know, the get off your, you know, get off my lawn thing, that's security theater. Your, you know, those neighborhood kids being on your front lawn doesn't matter. It's much more important to go worry about other threats. That's fair. But sometimes when you're inviting some non-threats, you're basically giving away some information about yourself and you might seem more open to actual threats of which you may not be aware. Nah, be, being the you know, cr crotchety old uh, neighbor who uh, yells at all the kids to get off your lawn just look, makes you look like a target. <laughs> really? Besides, the, the kids on your lawn, they might go and notice a real threat. <laughs> that's a good point. That, that's why I like you, Peter, because you have this adversarial type of thinking. Maybe you're doing this just for the sake of playing devil's advocate, but it's never void of substance. Or maybe I actually have a secret consulting contract by someone who wants to figure out how to go and uh, protect their lawn from neighborhood kids most effectively. Do you? <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't judge you if you did, but I suppose <laughs> you could do something more productive. Hey, if someone wants to go and uh, pay me, uh, you know, the, my, my usual fee for uh, that, I'm all for it. <laughs> I mean, that's not quite cryptography consultancy, but sounds promising. Well, you know, like uh, the funny thing about all this is like, I don't do cryptography consultancy per se. I do applied cryptography. You know, I, what, what I do is figure out how to apply cryptography to your problem. And that's actually not that related to cryptography itself. You know, cryptography is like the math of creating all these fancy schemes, particularly once you get into like academic cryptography where the schemes don't even have to go work. I feel like I've learned something new just here right now. I mean, <laughs> I, I wouldn't have thought about the difference between applied cryptography and cryptography. In my mind, it was just, oh, you take crypt cryptography and you put it into practice, but of course. Yeah, that's, that's surprisingly hard. I, I, I've actually, for, for clients, um, I've done quite a few interviews. Um, or, well, you know, I mean, I, I've, I've helped them do quite a few interviews with candidates. And it's quite sobering when you realize how many people with cryptography degrees do not understand how to go apply their cryptography to any real problem. And like one of the sort of interview questions I kind of come up with where you keep seeing people fail at is basically, well, all right, how would you go and design a simple, you know, PGP? You know, how does like the PGP web of trust work, right? Like these should be very simple questions, but they're actually kind of hard for people to grasp because they're not really mathematical. You know, they're much more about, well, what does crypto actually mean in the real world? And that's surprisingly hard for people to figure out. Yeah. Also, I forgot to ask the best, objectively best question that I received on Twitter. So, uh -oh. which steps would you take if you're the top dog of DevOps for Trezor or Ledger and wanted to steal Bitcoins from people's hardware wallets? You know, I hate to say this, but this would be a very easy thing. Um, all, all I would be worried about is getting caught, right? Because if, if my goal is purely to go steal the Bitcoins, you just go push a software update that uh, backdoors a random number generator, for instance, you know, or like backdoors the, the signing algorithm so it creates broken signatures. Now, the real question is, well, can I do this and not get caught? And that really comes down to how exactly is source code managed at these companies? And I've never actually looked at that into too much detail. Um, you know, I've, I've looked at it in detail for clients, but not as in how those companies actually do it. And you know, if you wanted to defend against that, you basically have to have 
individual programmers signing code commits and so on. And chances are your most likely way to get away with that would be to, you know, quite literally go walk up to like one of your coworkers' computers when they're, you know, not looking or something and then backdoor it and then get their computer to go and check in a code commit under their digital signature, assuming this is even used at all, so that they're the one with their name on it. And I suspect what I just told you is kind of fanciful in that you wouldn't even need to go that far. So you think it's easy to do, but it's hard to get away with it. I think it's easy to do and probably easy to get away with it too. Okay. But remember, like we're talking about criminal charges here. So if I was in that position to actually try to do that, I would be quite careful about not, you know, not having my name on the code. But, you know, frankly, like even if my name was on the code that resulted in a big Bitcoin loss, these days you wouldn't necessarily get much liability. Like, you know, you're, you're, issue there would be figuring out how to essentially launder the earnings that you got, which probably wouldn't be that hard, you know, make sure the Bitcoins eventually get back to you over time. And I think what this really says is like source control tends to be really terrible at companies. And I've seen this in my consulting where, you know, to give a somewhat anonymized example, uh, you know, I did some consulting for a company that held a very large amount of Bitcoins for other people. And I realized quite quickly that their Git repos weren't signed and they were hosted on the same infrastructure where the rest of the you know, system was, which all happened to go defeat their multi-sig scheme. Like this is the sort of thing that happens. And unfortunately, you know, modern software development just isn't up to the task of this. And it's the same issue. Like why are we running source code like why are we running the code compiled from our source code in the same security environment as we're editing the code because the moment you do that you know if you if you run like git pull right and review a code change and then run that code if you don't catch a security flaw someone can go back to your development environment and then commit whatever the hell they want like most software developers just don't protect against these, you know, these attacks. I mean, I'll be honest, I don't protect against them that well myself because none of the tooling set up for this. Well, at least I have different virtual machines for different projects. But, you know, most people do a really bad job of this. You know, the last time I felt like this and I recall it was when my parents told me there is no Santa Claus. <laughs> like, well... Funny enough, uh, I was the one who figured out that there was no Santa Claus, and I told my parents I thought Santa Claus sounded ridiculous. Apparently, I was like six or seven. Obviously, I was destined to be a security engineer. I mean, I had these moments myself, but they always find they would always find some kind of arguments and say, "Yeah, but you know, there's something magical about this, and you're." <laughs> And I would give it the benefit of the doubt. You, it's presence. Why, why would you bother to think too much about it? You get them. I was a very skeptical kid. <laughs> That's good. I, I didn't believe in magic. I'm happy that you ended up doing this because your insights are actually useful. And one idea that I got while you're explaining how you can basically steal people's Bitcoins if you're Prezer or Ledger was that if you have 1 million users, you can roll out an update and just take the equivalent of $1 from each user. And it's very unlikely that they will notice. And it's even more unlikely that they will proceed with some sort of legal charges. No, that's a terrible idea, I think. You're much better off taking everything from one user. Right, because if, if every if every user loses a little bit of money, that's incredibly suspicious. Right, the common factor is the software. Whereas if one loser, you know, user loses a ton of money, the common factor, well, there isn't one. I mean, maybe the user just screwed up. Yeah, that's also fair. But when you said they can steal the funds, I was thinking they can liquidate. 
all the accounts of all their users. Like if they have a million users and the average user holds about, say, $200 of Bitcoin, they can just take everything and just run away. But, but, but again, like from a point of view of getting away with it, you're much better off if the number of victims is small and they lose everything. You know, they may be very, they may be very pissed off, but it'll be harder for them, you know, depending on how you go pull it, pull off the attack to actually notice anything's wrong. You know, your ideal situation is to luck out and get one user with a ton of money on their device who isn't very technically savvy. Yeah, that, that's kind of scary now that I think about it. Yep. And there is a lot of trust that we put into these developers. Well, like, first of all, who's checking that the source code actually matches the binaries that wind up on these devices? Indeed, and some of them, like, how can you even check that? You know, because, of, because these devices are on secured hardware, there's no easy way to even dump the firmware on a lot of them, right? Like secure chips are not designed to let you just hook up a programmer and dump the firmware. That's, that's not the goal usually, which unfortunately is exactly the opposite of what you actually want for real security. So what do you think about using Bluetooth on certain hardware wallets? They claim it. I mean, Bluetooth isn't inherently bad. Like the, the real issue there is that chances are you'll have a Bluetooth implementation that's very complex and running on the same, you know, same environment, like same CPU, you know, same microcontroller as example, as your wallet code. And if your Bluetooth implementation came from the microprocessor vendor, which it probably did, it's not going to be very secure. On the other hand, if you like, say, have a separate microcontroller that then communicates to the real one over like a you know, simple serial interface, that's not so bad. Yeah, that's fair. but over. Yeah, but like overall, if I was really, if I really wanted the most secure hardware wallet, I would probably um, put an RS two thirty two interface on it, right? Because RS two thirty two is so simple that anyone can go get dump a full log of what's happening over that device. And this is actually easy to do because um, USB to RS-232 adapters are easy to get. So I had to look up RS-232. <laughs> I know what this is, so I've seen it before. I haven't used it much. Isn't it kind of yeah. nice? It's fast enough. It's a very, very, very old interface, but it's simple, it works. I mean, I used to use it all the time when I was doing uh, microprocessor development. You know, like I used to do electronics and uh, RS-232 is just kind of the standard. So is it faster than USB or why would anyone use it? It's, uh, it can be faster than USB 1. But basically, any modern USB is far slower. On the other hand, hardware wallets don't need much speed, right? Like the amount of data that they're passing from the wallet itself to the computer is minuscule. So it doesn't matter. As for why you'd use it, because it's dead simple and very easy to go audit. Like you can literally buy RS-232 adapters that have three ports on them, you know, input, output, and then tap. And then the tap electrically is totally isolated from everything else, you know, that it can't communicate, but gets you a full dump of everything that goes on. You know, that's great. Like, that's exactly what you want for auditing. Uh, I feel like we should be having a larger discussion about this type of security, as there are some people who recommend you, even when you're running, for example, Bitcoin Core on a computer that never gets connected to the internet, and they keep their private keys there. And they also use third day cages because they they also what they, use, they also use Faraday cages. They I mean, away all of the connection ports, anything that can be compromised. If they're running Bitcoin Core, 
and it's not ever connected to the internet, what the heck are they actually doing? Like you need somehow to get blocks into your Bitcoin core, you know, to actually do something useful. So, you know, you, you, I, you'd want to look at the details of a setup like that, see if it actually made any sense. Uh, I think I put it the wrong way. So the whole idea is to just store your keys on whole storage on a device that is connected to the internet. Yeah, but remember, keys themselves are not enough to actually verify a Bitcoin transaction. You know, you need to go and use those keys to verify transactions and sign transactions. Yep. Like, it's... You, you will need to communicate to the internet somehow. You know, you can go do it in better and worse ways, such as, say, you know, very auditable communication like we did in the Zcash Trusted Setup or potential like RS-232. But, you know, like the point is, I think setups like that, where you're starting to use extreme measures like Faraday cages, very rarely are those measures the low-hanging fruit. Now, in some cases, you know, they could be in theory, like again, the Zcash Trusted Setup, if they had botched the software, the Faraday cage I used on the compute node would have actually made sense. Unfortunately, it wasn't because, as usual, it was actually software that was low hanging fruit, and you know they botched that software. If you were to make a list of advice that you give to Bitcoiners, what would that include? To only use, for example, cables for internet connection and not Wi-Fi, and wired keyboards and stuff like that. Oh, I think that'd be part of it. But honestly, maybe the biggest piece of advice I'd give you is like actually learn how this stuff works and how to go think about security and you know, what this means. Unfortunately, I don't have any like easy answer there. But that like understanding that may actually be the most important thing people do. And the maybe the most important part of that type of security is really like how to think about threats. You know, what what could the attacks be? I mean can you go draw a diagram, for instance, of what attacks could happen on your wallet? Like, what are the scenarios? That That's probably the most important bit of advice. You know, canned things like, you know, don't use Wi-Fi or, you know, only use cables or whatever. I don't know that's as important as just understanding what your threats actually are and what you're trying to prevent. Actually, yeah, because usually we get security advice, but we have no idea what they are for. And we don't associate yep. any practical use case with them. We are being told, yep. don't, don't do that. And we will take it for granted. Yeah. And this doesn't just happen with private keys. It's just all over. Yeah. Well, you know, security is a lemon market. Like most people buying security in the various forms you can get it have no way of verifying that they're actually getting what they paid for. That's a mind blower. So when you buy pretty much anything that pretends to be secure, you have to trust somebody that they're being honest to you. Well, you know, it's uh, it's an anti-tiger rock. This this rock uh, protects you against tigers. Look, there's no tigers around. Even when you buy a lock, right, you have to trust the locksmith. Have you ever looked at YouTube's lock picking section? No. <laughs> Locks are like the most hilariously bad example of security where you know, like there's YouTubers who basically their whole channel is lock picking videos. And for the you know ones who are half decent at it, like there is the the locks that they say are really good, they go and lock pick in real time on YouTube in like a minute, you know. Lock picking something in a minute is considered to be a really good lock. Oh man! You know, fortunately, like we can do better with computer security, fortunately. But yeah, no locks have to be a pretty bad example of this. So, how should one store their keys? Is multi-sig a good idea? If you actually use it, but you know. 
uh, again, like my sort of canned advice to people is, yeah, just set up another computing device of some kind, stick a wallet on, don't use it for anything else. And, you know, think about like what, like where you're getting your payments info from, right? Because if you, you know, if you have, like if you log into Kraken, right, on a compromised computer, that computer has full control over everything you're going to do there. And for instance, it can go and rewrite the addresses that you see on screen. So when you send your, you know, ten thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin to, you know, maybe go buy a new jacuzzi or something, like that address may not be the one you think it is. So is not good. Asks you, how should he secure his private key apart from writing it down or memorizing it? And is memorizing your private key a good idea at all? People are terrible at memorization. <laughs> if, if you actually try memorizing it, there's a decent chance you'll find out that you're actually not good enough to do it. You know, you, people can memorize like 128 bit keys, but only if they actually practice it. And most people aren't going to do that. I'd suggest writing it down and keeping that piece of paper somewhere safe. I suppose one side of security is to protect yourself from your own mistakes, right? Well, like you, you got to look at security holistically, right? It's not just about attackers. It's also about mistakes. So you can compromise your whole setup yourself if you're not able to replicate the security model. Well, yeah. I mean, quite simply, if you, if you do such a good job at protecting your private keys that you lose them, what was the point? I also like to think that in the situation where, God forbid, you get tortured and you have the private key memorized, I mean, it's kind of easy to extract. Even though I'm not sure you should be risking your life or money. Well, you know, again, like that gets to threat modeling. If that's the type of threat you have, chances are your Bitcoins aren't actually the thing you should be worried about. Of course, the flip side of that is if that's the kind of threat you have in your, you know, in your area, there may be no way to protect yourself, right? Because if you go give up your keys, how do they know that you gave up the full set? I mean, this is why like uh, key disclosure laws in general are just so insane. Because the way crypto works is that you can't prove that you gave up, you know, keys to things. Yeah. I mean, when, when you give away a key to your car, I guess, you can prove that there is no other, one way or the other. But in terms of cryptography... Well, you, we, but point is, you can only do that because a car is a physical thing that is limited number. All right? When you're talking about giving up decryption keys for data, because encrypted data is random stuff, You know, there's no good way to go prove it. And the second part, like the second part that really makes it ugly uh, with like key disclosure laws is it's so easy for cops to go and just plant, you know, encrypted hard drives in your, you know, say in your apartment. I mean, it's effectively the equivalent of like planting drugs. And, you know, you just get encrypted hard drive full of random data, stick it off in your apartment and say, well, why, why don't you do, decrypt that? We found it in your apartment. Or, you know, what's the key for it? Of course, you don't know. And then you wind up in jail for it. You know, it's just one of these very, very obvious threats. And when you can get, S, you know, micro SD cards like the size of your thumbnail that have capacities of, you know, half a terabyte, like it's just so trivial for a cop to just, you know, stick a micro SD card in their pocket and then go drop it on a, you know, on a scene. Like it's just something that you cannot have in a free society because it's too easy to abuse it. And we can't trust the police. You know, we know that they go plant drugs on people. They've been caught on their, uh, you know, on their own um, police cams. You know, and every time you, see, you know, find a case like that, remember, there's probably another hundred that didn't get caught. You know, it's just a very ugly thing. But I think the Bitcoin relevance of that is if that is the type of threat you're worried about, there may be nothing you can go do. Yeah, speaking of drugs, Carol Zagoras wants to know if you like weed. Well, I like being able to get into the U.S., so uh, no comment. And, uh, that's the best way of replying to that. 
Well, like remember, even now, even though it's legalized, if you admit to ever using weed, you can get banned from the U.S. for life. Really? Yeah. Yeah, in Canada, it's completely legal. I can order, like, I can literally go to an Ontario government website and order weed with my credit card. Yet, if the U.S. finds out, I can get banned from life. And especially crazy, but that is, well, remember, when I order it with my credit card, that information goes through a U.S. server. The Ontario government really should be accepting Bitcoin for this. Yeah. <laughs> I, I suppose that's one of the use cases that was initially very popular for Bitcoin. There might be a return there. Probably still is, really. You know, maybe not. I mean, the, the numbers I've heard, which, you know, I just take a grain of salt, is probably like 1% of Bitcoin transactions are related to drug sales. You know, like 0.5%. That's the kind of numbers... Uh, chain analysis throws around which isn't that bad right i mean with cash i can maybe it's not one percent hey when you say what that that bad like what would be bad what's wrong with people getting uh drugs that they want to they're not harming anyone other than than uh than themselves no oh, well. that's you know i'm fully for legalization they cannot just claim that it It's being used for illegal stuff in the majority of cases. Just because it's legal doesn't mean it's bad. No, obviously, but what you're trying <laughs> to frame Bitcoin as something for criminals you are going to point out to drugs and to prostitution and whatever else is illegal and possibly immoral in the views of some. Well, you know, a whole bunch of people who want to, to keep the money flowing to their law enforcement jobs. For victimless crimes but that's kind of that's a whole another issue yeah i feel like we should go back to bitcoin for a moment because american huddle and i'm not sure if you know his meme but he recommends people to hold or huddle 6.15 btc and he has that's a that's a very specific number yeah and it's tied to the size of his dick apparently <sighs> You know, I can assure you it isn't because the units don't match up. <laughs> you know, Bitcoin's a unitless number and the size of his dick would involve, you know, either length or volume, maybe weight. Like, you know, I, I, I did enough physics to know, like, this just doesn't make sense. I mean, I'm pretty sure he uses the imperial system, <laughs> possibly. If it's the metric system, then that's bad, man. <laughs> That's like two inches. But anyway, he says that Blue Matt has upped his Bitcoin success prediction from 5% to 50%. And do you have any prediction in terms of percentage for success? What's his, what's his definition of success in the first place? Exactly. Some, somebody like Adel Wave said <laughs> he'd probably say it depends on how we're defining success. Yep. Well, that'd be a good prediction. So, Uh, let's say that I mean, organization so, means adoption on a very large scale, maybe even governmental. Is what does large mean? I mean, gold is adopted on a very large scale, but on the other hand, is also barely used at all. That's a fair point. But even if it got to the point of gold, in my book, given its humble beginnings, it would be a success. Well, I, I, the point I always like to make is Bitcoin can be an incredible success just by forcing, you know, the rest of the world to do better things. Like if Bitcoin forces PayPal to have more reasonable policies, Bitcoin's a success, even if it doesn't actually get used that much. That's also a good point. You know, I mean, that, and that's really more my, my definition of success. And at the same time, I also like to point out how in the long run, everything goes back to zero. You know, one day Bitcoin will go to zero. You know, it will eventually fail like everything else. Yeah. <laughs> in, the, in the really long run, one day the last uh, copy of the Bitcoin blockchain will get deleted. That's a grim thought. And that's a very, very, very unpopular opinion. <laughs> like... Well, you, you know, it, it's just reality. Like all, all, all these things are temporary. Now, I think where I would say Bitcoin is is a success 
is I couldn't tell you whether it's the U.S. dollar that will fail first or Bitcoin. You know, I, I, I don't have a sense for what the probabilities of, of those two are. And I think either one could happen. You know, whereas if you'd asked me that, maybe at the very beginning, I'd be more dubious. But certainly at this point, like it's totally plausible Bitcoin could outlast the U.S. dollar. So I would say you're pretty optimistic because the U.S. dollar has such, you know, it's quite a catchphrase nowadays to call it a, a network effect and U.S. dollar. Have you seen the history of fiat currencies? They often do just fine until they fail. Yeah. You know, all it would take is the U.S. to go and uh, elect some crazy president who does something particularly stupid. So far, Trump isn't that crazy you know, isn't sufficiently crazy and stupid enough to get the U.S. into that situation. But, like, that that's the kind of thing that can go happen. You know, if, if you'd asked people, like, what, 15 years ago, um, how well Venezuela was doing, they'd probably say, just great, look at all this oil money. Yeah, but Venezuela does not hold the reserve currency of the world. Well... It's, you know, it changes the probabilities, but that can change. Lots of people predicting like China is, um, you know, uh, currency will become the reserve currency. Equally, people who would have said, oh, yeah, China's going to do well. I mean, that may also be false. Like, it's just, it's not that predictable. But I think what we can say is it's certainly plausible for Bitcoin to outlast these. But even if it does, I mean, eventually it's still going to fail. Just take enough time. I, I feel like this is still optimistic. <laughs> I would say 50% if you think it will outlast the US dollar. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's the sort of number I could imagine. See, where, where I'd compare me is like someone like, um, like David Gerard, who has been saying Bitcoin will go fail since forever. And the only thing failing uh, is really his predictions. I mean, he has his audience, and I suppose he makes a decent living expressing that view. Well, that might tell you something about why he has that view. Yeah, I, I don't think that view is really based on any like proper factual analysis. I think it's based on he has an audience that likes that view. Yeah, I, I think the same thing's true with a lot of like anti-Tesla analysis. Where, well, certainly some parts of it are factual, that's, you know, it's because of an audience. And sure enough, the audience for anti Bitcoin and anti Tesla actually seems to overlap a lot. And both of them, you know, both those audiences seem very annoyed that neither dies. Yeah, I mean, this also tells us a lot about the media landscape in general and how you have some sort of opinion which gets propagated all the time just because it has an audience but has no scientific or factual grounds yeah no absolutely you know and it's i think it's just as true of harper waltz as it is of uh media you know like why why things become popular has got very little to do with how good they are sometimes i uh, i feel like you have blown my mind quite a few times in this interview and there's a lot to digest there. I mean, you get into this space and I'm not the most technical person. I don't claim to be, but I'm not going to go debating people and having very strong opinions like McCormack while claiming not to be technical. But there's a lot to be learned. And really, people like you don't really go out giving advice randomly and selling courses and stuff like that because you have much more interesting stuff to do with your life i suppose you're actually successful in doing consultancy for applied cryptography and then somewhat successful have, okay <laughs> relatively but you're going to have people who you know apply this old saying about those who cannot do that they teach they they're going to sell you bad classes about security and teach you bad advice essentially 
Although keep in mind, like their their business model is not that different from my business model consulting. Yeah, obviously, mm-hmm. you're telling people you're teaching people what they should be doing. Exactly. Yeah, you know, like that. That's a hard thing about this, you know. Sort of saying, but you know, those who uh, can't do teach, there's certainly value in teaching and teaching, like you know, especially in the form of consulting, can be a nice stable line of work with less risks that lets you go do more things and have more influence. You know, if I can go and help 10 companies go do something, I may have a much bigger lever to go make changes to the world than if I'd gone focused on my own project. Whoa. (laughs) So what are you up to? Well, uh, not, not sure if I have funding for it, but uh, I have been working on my uh, proof marshal stuff um, on and off lately. And of course, there's my open timestamps thing. And, uh, you know, both of them, like the projects really uh, boil down to making truthful statements about data. Um, open timestamps makes a very simple statement of proving, you know, something exists in the past. And then proof Marshall extends that by saying, well, Rather than just existence, we'll go say it's the only thing that existed in some category. And those two state, you know, those two classes of statements turn out to be quite powerful. So what are the practical applications of these? Well, like a really simple one is uh, with digital signatures. You know, let's suppose you have a digital signature on a document and the private key gets leaked. How do you verify the signature now that the attacker could have made, uh, you know, made it? Well, if you have a timestamp and you can go show that the timestamp you know, proves that the document existed prior to the private key leak, you now can still verify the signature even though the key was compromised. And this is proof marshal? That's uh, open timestamps. Okay. That's probably the, the that's probably the simplest use case for it. And uh, as an example, um, Bitcoin Core repo. There's various committers to it who use open timestamps with their Git commits. So you have this constant timestamp of when, so, you know, when code was added to Bitcoin Core, and you can go back and go verify these signatures. You know, you also like see this in. Uh, you know, I mean, evidence in general, like very, very often you can go rule out um, certain types of attacks by just saying it exists in the past. You know, maybe as an example, like you have a contract with a company and when the contract was signed, there was no reason to do anything malicious about it. But after the fact, someone finds out, hang on a second, we would have been in a much better position had, say, this clause been changed, you know? Maybe like I don't know, maybe it's a farming contract, right? And you want to go and go back in time and go add a clause about uh, you know damages due to bad weather. Of course, you don't know that bad weather will exist in the past, but if you find out later, well, certainly you want to go change the contract. And having that timestamp on that contract, you know, amongst with other verification of it, can be quite valuable to say, hang on a second, no, no, this is what it actually existed. Now, in that case, depending on the circumstances, you could go do something where you actually have two different versions of contract, right? And you timestamp them, them both. That's where proof marshal comes in because it can go rule out the existence of conflicting versions of something. Hold up a minute, Peter. So you're telling me that a Turing complete smart contract doesn't fix this? <laughs> Well, what I'm really telling you is that Proof Marshall lets you create tr- those Turing complete smart contracts using this much simpler primitive. Yeah, and you don't see, see mo- like most of the complexity of Proof Marshall will actually be um, using it to create smart contracts, but the core primitive that it needs is just uniqueness. Yeah, you because know, once you have some, like once you have a unique set of actions. And you can say, all right, that's what happened. You can always run a program on those actions and then come to a conclusion about what your current state is. You know, for, for all this nonsense, but sharing completeness, that's what Ethereum is. 
a big shared set of actions, you know, set of data that you run a program over and it comes to the same conclusion as everyone else's. It's just in Ethereum, actually running that program is really hard because Ethereum has hardly any full nodes. And they've blown up their blockchain. And Proof Marshall, you know, can be much more scalable than that because you only need the data for your particular application. You don't care about anyone else's contracts. So I suppose this will not require to use anything related to blockchains and stuff, right? Well, yes and no. I mean, one way to go put it would be to say it lets you create your own blockchains bootstrapped over other blockchains. You know, like blockchain itself, like a block, a chain of blocks is a very useful data structure. People have overloaded that term to go mean a whole bunch of other nonsense. But the idea of having a chain of blocks is really valuable. And, you know, my goal with Proof Marshall is in part to make it really easy to make chains of blocks when they make sense. You know, maybe you need an audit log for something. A chain of blocks would be very useful. And if you can make that chain of blocks be unique, by tying it back to say something like Bitcoin, you know, using something I call a single use seal, then that's very valuable. But to get there, you need a whole bunch of infrastructure, you know, you need a whole bunch of software to write and so on. So it's, it's a much harder thing to implement than say open timestamps where, you know, timestamp proof is very simple by comparison. I can see that you have been working on this for at least four months. And you know. uh, longer than uh, longer than I can admit without being a little embarrassed. <laughs> I, mean, I think I came up with the name Proof Marshall like what three years ago. So yeah, it's been it's taken a while. Are you looking for anyone to help you code this or for any kind of review? Sure. I mean, hell, it's up on GitHub. Um, GitHub.com slash uh, Peter Todd slash Proof Marshall. I'm not sure if I have the right kind of audience to find people who would be interested in helping you, but it's worth giving it a shot. Yeah. Let them know what the URL is anyway. Anyway, it's really interesting that you're working on this and you're not really stuck into you know, the mainstream conversation about Bitcoin nowadays. You're thinking outside of that box and that's useful in itself. Well, you know, I think particularly like this sort of reflexive, you know, Bitcoin, not blockchain thing that a lot of people have. Well, it's, I think it's understandable given the craziness of the ICO space. It does sort of throw out the baby with the bathwater. Yeah. Some people would argue that you, your talents would better be used in Bitcoin Core. But well, I mean, criticize you for stuff like RBF and the idea that Bitcoin should have inflation and stuff like that, you know, unpopular opinions that you expressed. <laughs> well, I think the inflation one's kind of funny because, yeah, I, I, I would say quite. You know, I'd say quite concretely that Satoshi made a mistake there. On the other hand, the difference between zero inflation and like a fixed, like, you know, 0.5% or something isn't very big. It's after all the current Bitcoin inflation rates, um, after the halving, it'll be what, 2% or something? You know, obviously having inflation isn't deadly to Bitcoin. But pr probably the really funny one is just the RBF nonsense. Like, p p people forget that. The type of RBF that actually got implemented in Bitcoin Core is not the type I wanted. Okay, can you elaborate? Well, you know, I argued for quite a long time, I mean, many, many years, that replaced by fees should just be, well, you know, nodes accept whatever is a higher fee transaction, end of story. What actually got implemented is an opt in thing. So the previous you know, zero conf behavior of, well, there's a sort of vaguely slightly secure thing that doesn't actually work. This does exist. And you always were able to create transactions that could be double spent. You know, like you, you just do this by broadcasting a transaction with a low fee followed by a high fee. 
and enough nodes will reject the low fee one and ignore it, that the high fee one will probably get mined. You know, I've got a blog post actually on this where I tested this prior to um, opt-in RBF getting widely implemented. Like, and on top of that, at least when I tested that, wallets were so bad at handling double spends that that often, for instance, not even recognize a double spend after it had been mined. You know, this this business about oh, I screwed up zero conf or something like it just completely ignored reality of just how bad wallets actually were. Now, I think like where that really came from is just people who are lying to each other about what Bitcoin's good for. I think that also happened in what year was it? 2014, 2015. Yeah, I think that's about the right time period. And people were still stuck. I, I, I mean, some people were still thinking of Bitcoin as a cheap way of transacting. And they are the same kind of people who moved on to Bitcoin Cash afterwards. Which, if anyone actually used it, would be an expensive way of transacting. Exactly. You know, like the irony is, like nobody uses Bitcoin Cash. You know, anyone with a shred of common sense or like technical chops would understand that Bitcoin Cash and like Bitcoin, you know, BSV models don't make sense. You know, it's just it. Bitcoin so obviously doesn't scale. Yeah, I think the problem we had in the Bitcoin space and the wider cryptocurrency space is making things that actually work is hard. And it's quite a bit harder to make them profitable by selling tokens. You know, it's much easier to sell a token when you have this unscalable shared consensus model. Selling a token for Lightning is kind of hard. Like it is hard to imagine Lightning with a made up token attached. You know, other than, of course, like Bitcoin itself, but you can't bolt on another token to Lightning and have it make sense. So if you want to be a scammer and just make a bunch of money with an ICO, the type of architectures that work don't make sense for you and you're not going to push them. You know, Proof Marshall is an example. It's completely unimaginable how the hell I would add a token to it. Open timestamps, same thing. How would I add a token to open timestamps? It makes no sense. Of course, Tyrion did try to go do that, and Tyrion's, a, you know, it was marketed as a scam. End of story. That's a very direct opinion. <laughs> Some people- well, I, I, I wrote a blog post on this. Like, Tyrion's, Tyrion's marketing was a scam. They lied about what Tyrion could actually go do. You know, this, unfortunately, is just a very, very clear-cut thing. And it's funny, too, because... The way they lied about it even went a little beyond the minimum they needed. Uh, you know, like one of the key things being they compared it to open timestamps and saying they had lower latency than open timestamps. They didn't need to do this for the purpose of selling an ICO token. But I think part of this is once you know you're in a mode where you're going to lie about the ne- you know the necessity of your tokens, you also might as well go lie about the performance of uh, your system. I didn't know about this, but it makes a lot of sense. And Vitalik... Yeah. I mean, this is I, how you I, get 25 million. I know you were friends with him or something because he's also from Canada and for a while... I wouldn't say I was ever friends with him. Okay. okay. I, mean, I, I, I met him quite early on, but I, I never really liked the guy. He always seemed dubious to me. Okay. You know, like he, he, he always gave the impression of being dishonest. I mean, it's very hard to get clear signals from him because he's so awkward. Well, I think that's actually a put on thing to try to distract people from, you know, the times he's marketed Ethereum with lies as an example. You know, like they keep on having to go pivot to new variants of Ethereum precisely because they're never able to admit, well, yeah, Ethereum doesn't scale and we don't know how to make it scale. You know, like that's just not how it was advertised in the beginning. And that was a lie. They knew damn well that it didn't scale and they had no, you know, no path forward for that. But like, this is how you go and sell ICO tokens. Yep. You know, like, like look this way when you're committing securities fraud and the SEC could throw you in jail for it. 
lying about like the details of how your system works. That's a really technical thing that not many people understand. You might as well do that too. You know, the additional bit isn't going to get you much more trouble than you're already risking. Yeah, that that's why I don't think we can replicate Bitcoin at this point. Well, yeah, like it, it's it's not good for society if Bitcoin gets replicated a ton of times. You know, you only need it to create one made up token out of thin air to do what Bitcoin needs to do. Yeah, you know, there's some minor things that I I would want to go see change, but you know, my, my big one is I think Bitcoin should have a small bit of inflation and. The difference between, like, my argument only becomes relevant in maybe another 20 years anyway, so it doesn't really matter that much right now. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how the security is going to be maintained, right? Sometimes I think that mining will no longer be profitable at some point, and the development of ASICs is going to stagnate. And people will do it because it's a hot. Well, it's it, hang on. It's okay if the development of ASIC stagnates. That's probably a good thing for us. The, the issue is really like a tax based on there not being enough money going into mining. All right. And keep on mining can, like, if mining isn't very profitable, that's okay too. All right. All that matters is is there enough money being spent on proof of work for Bitcoin to be secure? And in a system where your, you know, your inflation reward eventually goes down to zero. You're now relying on transaction fees, and there's just no reason. You know, there aren't good reasons to think they actually will work out. Like, yes, you certainly could pay for security with transaction fees, but there's all kinds of weird game theoretical stuff about, you know, well, maybe I won't mine a block now, or kind of wait later, and so on. It's just a much simpler, easier to, you know easier to analyze system if there's always an inflation reward. Relying only on transaction fees is a dangerous thing. I guess we're going to have this debate, as you said, 20 years from now. But do you think that at some point mining will be much more decentralized if adoption grows? So, for example, everybody... Sometimes I think there will be a return to that initial one CPU, one vote model, and people will just run a mining rig on their regular computers. And we why? Because at some point, what is their incentive? Okay, that's a good point. But what is people's incentive to run a node? So why don't they also run a mining node on the same computer? Their incentive to run a node is if they don't run a node they can go be attacked by the person who they go trust to run a node for them. I mean, that's a very simple, clear-cut thing. And if you make running a node to be cheap enough, then it makes sense to go and do that rather than risk that attack. Yeah, like That's what it comes down to. A lot of people don't run nodes, and they risk that attack. Running a node and, you, you know, and actually using it. Because keep in mind, just running a node isn't enough. You, you know, run a node off in a corner of your apartment but don't actually use it, you might as well not be running a node. But if you run a node and use it for your wallet, then you're protecting yourself against attack. Whereas mining doesn't really protect yourself against attack. It just uses up energy to you know, maybe create a block like once in a while. There's no direct benefit to you other than the profitability of it. Now, maybe if you need the, the waste heat, then it could make sense. But... You know, the question there is, do you need the waste heat and is the equipment to do mining cheap enough to make that, you know, make that a good economic argument? Yeah, so my dream of decentralizing mining is not really... Well, but m- mining will always wind up being fairly decentralized because cheap power is inherently relatively decentralized. Right? Like, mining is a race to the bottom and the cheapest power is available in relatively small amounts spread around the world. That's just, that's just the nature of cheap opportunities for power. And part of cheap means also being able to get rid of the waste heat and you know, do something useful for it. That's, that inherently doesn't um, lend well to centralization. You know, it's much cheaper to get rid, rid of a megawatt of heat than 100 megawatts of heat. Because a megawatt of heat, you, first of all, you can probably go do something useful with it. 
you know, if it's only maybe warm a greenhouse or something. And secondly, like just basic physics, it is easier to get rid of a small amount of heat than a large amount. Similarly, getting a megawatt of cheap electricity, that's going to be easier than getting 100 megawatts of cheap electricity, all, all things being equal. Because if 100 watts of cheap make electricity existed, someone will go use it for something else. Okay. Like, like this is why Bitcoin mining tends to be done in weird locations with somewhat stranded uh, hydro resources, particularly um, stranded in a, like regulatory sense, right? Where, you know, there's rules for like what you can go use power for, who can, you know, where you can go connect things. And, oh, you know, there's a few megawatts there for some hydro plant that really should have never been built in the first place. Well, how do you use it? You go stick a mining rig next to it. You know, China d did happen to have a ton of that because China's communist, you know, central planning in geography meant there's a whole ton of hydropower in all kinds of weird locations that didn't really make much sense. And, you know, you're seeing some of that uh, happen again in other places. You know, you're also seeing things like um, doing Bitcoin mining with uh, flared, you know, gas from uh, oil rigs and so on. So where do you see Bitcoin in more than 20 years? Let's say, do you believe it will still be around in 30, 40 years? Uh, I'd give it a high chance. You know, probably like your 50-50 type of thing. But, you know, all this stuff's hard to predict. Like, human civilization might not be around that long if we fuck it up enough. That's also fair. And there are a lot of people denying our, you know, effect on the environment and ourselves. Yeah. Well, you know, we're not likely to screw up the environment that quickly, but you certainly could imagine like nuclear war, you know, breaking out. And it would, it would not take much uh, nuclear war to really screw up most of humanity. You know, and this is not to say that like we would actually be extinct, but you know, if in 40 years, like, civilization doesn't exist as we know it, I, I could certainly imagine that. It'd take, like, one, you know, one nuclear war to do that. You know, like, the, the problem we have is industrial supply chains are just so, like, so diverse, and they span the planet, and they're really hard to replace. You know, it wouldn't take that many countries, like, going to war with each other to screw all that up. Who knows? Well, maybe we'll see a bit of this in miniature as this uh, coronavirus stuff progresses. Yeah, that's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. Yep. I mean, uh, here in Romania, I already see people wearing masks in public, which is kind of excessive. Pro yeah, I mean, it's probably not a harmful thing. Pro probably good in terms of uh, you know, face recognition. Uh, I think more wearing a mask would probably be good for society. But, you know, like, like certainly things like, uh, you know, sh shutting down borders is probably the right move. And it, like part of the issue there is like we don't really have a good handle on what's really going on because China lies. You know, the Chinese government is an authoritative uh, dictatorship. Yeah. I think I have two more questions for you, and we have been going on for almost two hours, and I'm not sure if it's been <laughs> up to this point. I hope they will, and if you do, just tag us on Twitter and say, hey, I, I have heard that part. <laughs> and one of the questions that come to mind when you talk to somebody who has been around for such a long time, and obviously you're a talented person in security and coding, and why are you not Satoshi? What what is your general reply to that? Well, I am Satoshi. We are all Satoshi, but why are you not in particular? What is your No, I am Satoshi. And in this grand tradition of Craig Wright, I will give you absolutely no evidence to, su to suggest that's true. I mean we have and if it's good enough for Craig Wright, obviously I'm Satoshi. Also I'm Craig Wright, just to be clear about this. That other Craig Wright is a total scammer pretending to be me. 
I mean, I could see that too, but I have to check with my lawyer. <laughs> yeah, I don't think Craig Wright's going to sue me anytime soon. I mean, he slandered Greg Maxwell quite a lot. Well, he slandered me too, but like Craig's in so much legal trouble. I can't imagine he wants to add another jurisdiction to it. Possibly. But seriously, though, you have quite some points of contention and some ideas that are very anti-Bitcoin, like inflation. But if you're Satoshi, that would be the perfect cover-up, well, right? Well, why do you think they're anti-Bitcoin? I think Bitcoin needs inflation. Thus, my idea of inflation is pro-Bitcoin. I think that's something we have in common, <laughs> economist fathers. <laughs> I also tried to explain Bitcoin to my father and was like, what's the point of having a fixed supply? I mean, he had- no, 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 no. With my dad, it was totally different. It was more, oh, well, obviously this is going to be valuable. Like it, he, he didn't need much convincing, you know, the, the digital gold argument's a very simple one. Of course, keep in mind, gold is inflationary. Of course, you find new sources all the time. Yeah. And gold has the problem that the, the supply isn't bounded. Like, like, you know, as an example, if you took all the gold on the earth and transported it to the surface, it would cover the entire planet in a layer, if I remember correctly, about a meter and a half thick. You know, there is a lot of gold out there, far more than we have access to right now. And we don't know how much gold technology will you know, be able to mine in the future. You know, maybe we'll find a gold asteroid some, somewhere or something. Like, gold does not have a strictly limited supply. I agree with that. And it's going to be interesting to see how our civilization ends up receiving money in the end. Because in the last 40 plus years, 50 it's been that long since 71, almost 50, 49. Yep. We have had a different model, which is based on consumption and excess. And a lot of development around the world has happened because of this, just because they had the power to print more money and give it to develop. Well, uh, though I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like, talk about that in terms of consumption and excess. The way I'd go talk about it is very simple you are taxed on savings and you are forced to invest. That's not the same thing as consumption. Yeah, that's a fair point. Even though, you know, actually you don't know, but in my country, more than 50% of the GDP is generated by internal consumption. So if people start saving at some point and they say, I don't need to buy the latest iPhone, I don't need to buy that, why don't I just save the money? The whole system is going to collapse under its own weight. No. No, I, I would say no. And the reason why I'd say no is it's quite possible to go put that money into investing. You know, it's not, it's not so simple to say that... We, we have to have consumption. Uh, like, the, like the standard you know, economic arguments about this are actually about investment. You, know, you, you want to go tax un, you know, unproductive savings and then stick them off into investing where they go do something productive and push society forward. I think the bigger issue is just we've pushed uh, interest rates so incredibly low that they might as well be zero and all this stuff kind of gets out of whack. Yeah, and the, like the other aspect of that is, um, you know, inflation is incredibly regressive in that it doesn't affect the rich because the rich can go park their money in investments that aren't affected by inflation at all. Inflation is much more about the poor. I never really thought about it. In these terms, like inflation is about the poor. But it does make sense. I mean, it's kind of a system which preserves the class system and the establishment. 
Well, but again, I, I, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't talk about in terms of preserving the class establishment or any of that. Like a lot of that's just, it's kind of inherent. I mean, the moment you have a complex economy, you're going to wind up with classes because achievements are, you know, hereditary to some extent. And the, the curves on like your return on investment of achievement are just so extreme. It's, you know, it's effectively unthinkable to get rid of that. Okay. Yeah, I think, like, the more interesting thing is just really, I'd say, issues of fairness. You know, the simple reality is if you have a system where there is no way to, inv you know, invest your money other than investments in the standard way, you're really you know, narrowing your choices for people. Like, you can't go and save money in a piggy bank the way you used to be able to. I feel like for the last question, I should get back to the initial topic. And I remember in Berlin, <laughs> you saw the new HTC phone, which runs. Oh, yeah, that one. <laughs> so this 1S. And I wrote a review about it. I wasn't happy about what I discovered. I feel like the full note is kind of gimmicky and there's nothing you can do with it outside of their native wallet. So what is your opinion on the phone you tested it right you bought one uh, yeah I, I i looked at it a bit and honestly like the very fact like the case back is uh you know it's got like a laser printed um you know bitcoin logo type thing i mean to me that already screams a bit of a gimmick you know and i think part of the issue here is it's just like other uh, hardware wallet stuff only by a less reputable manufacturer, you know, and I say less reputable, not because HTC in general is less reputable, but obviously they don't have much expertise doing hardware and wallet stuff. So why would I trust them with it? I'm not even yeah. sure if, if they partnered with some sort of reputed hardware wallet manufacturer or they just developed their own system. Well, the fact you're not even sure about that, I think answers your question. Right, regardless of the answer to that, that that the answer isn't clear is part of the trust problem. So I reckon you don't recommend this phone to anyone. No, nah, no. Nah. I, I I only got one because I thought it would be a neat thing to go have and be able to go take a look at. And I had a nice excuse to do a big lightning purchase with it, which incidentally the lightning uh, transaction worked just fine. <laughs> yeah i mean it's a decent phone even though I, I suppose it's priced fairly but it has old specs and runs an old operating system which i don't think gets any updates yeah now android in general is a mess that way yeah it's uh, unfortunately we have all these android like the, the way android really should have worked is you know like windows on you know for that matter linux on normal pc hardware where everyone just has an open standard and you just install the software. But unfortunately, that's not what happened. You know, there's no easy way to just load a standard phone distribution, if you will, the way you would on a PC. Is that why the first example that you gave for recommendation that you give to people to install wallets, you said they should buy an iPhone because it, it has more security? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and it's unfortunate because there's a lot of reasons to not trust Apple. But overall, you'd probably have a little more, you know, good luck with uh, Apple than uh, Android. Like the, the other possibility there is just go buy, you know, Google Pixel. But, you, you know, like that recommendation is kind of out of practicality, really. You know, the one I would kind of recommend maybe even before that is get a ThinkPad and go install it. Linux distribution on it, then go put it all it on, or you know, use Tails. But the audience for that is, you know, a bit more narrow than just a very generic recommendation that anyone can do. But is Tails really safe? Because as far as I know, it connects to the internet all the time. Well, I mean, I don't I don't think that that threat is what I'm worried about as much. You know, like you 
to use Bitcoin in general, you have to go use the internet. Like for a variety of reasons, I just don't think that's the biggest threat I'm worried about for your sort of basic advice. You know, the more important thing is just don't use the computer for very much. You know, don't go off using it to run games and stuff like that. Yeah, and this makes a lot of sense to have dedicated devices. We seem to have forgotten in this era where you get one device that can do anything sometimes. No, it can't, but, but like the fact you have to give that advice is a massive failure of computer security. You know, we shouldn't have to give that advice. It's a bit ridiculous, really. But because we've done such a terrible job at computer security, you know, if I, if I had a more sophisticated audience, I would say install t- um, cubes. But for that very generic advice, yeah, uh, Apple phone is probably a decent option. You know, it's the advice I've given to, like, you know, some friends and family who uh, were very non-technical. But, yeah, like, the, 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 there aren't good options here. You know, and again, like, remember, the issue with all of this is how do you actually go use your Bitcoin? You know, the moment you log into Kraken, you have this um, uh, compromised device issue anyway. There's not much development going on in Ubuntu for mobile, right? Not that I know of. I remember it was supposed to be huge, but it didn't do much. Well, you know, mobile is a very tough thing to develop for because so much effort needs to be put on to... uh, good UI design. It is, it is tough to write, you know, to make good, um, you know, good touchscreen interfaces. And companies like Google and Apple put a ton of research into it and a ton of money. You know, it's much easier to write a command line application. It's also interesting that in this space where the buzzword for such a long time has been let's decentralize, even though it doesn't make sense most of the times. But we recommend companies that have a good record for security, like Apple, and also have a more ethical collection of private data. But don't think that's saying that centralization is good. That's just saying that overall, the, you know, the choices we have are so terrible that that still winds up being the best for, you know, some class of users. All right. Like my, my more sophisticated advice for more technical people is very decentralized. You know, it's get a PC and install a, you know, a Linux operating system on it. Right. Like that's a very decentralized type of advice made possible by the very decentralized PC market. But unfortunately, you know, because of lack of investment and so on, that market is kind of getting pushed out. Also, like it's partly a monopoly thing. You know, Apple and Google would love if PCs stop existing. They're even trying to replace them. <laughs> and uh, I think Google has opened yeah. really with the Chromebooks. And... Well, like look how um, on um, iOS, there is no easy way to write programs for it without Apple permission. You know, that's an incredibly locked down environment, but there aren't good answers. Yeah, that's delicate. And I know for a fact that even for Bitcoin wallets, it's very hard to add features. I know that Blockstream has had, has had to work for months to be able to implement Tor. And yep. I think right now green address is called Blockstream Green. But they did manage to implement Tor, and they are the only ones that were able to do it. Well, on Android, you could run anything through Tor, actually, with um, uh, yeah. uh, the Warbot proxy. But, uh, you know, again, like this kind of comes down to like choices in your operating systems. You know, it's so easy for Google to go shut this down. And if I remember correctly, like Apple doesn't let you, you know, doesn't make it possible to write Orbot at all which is ridiculous, but, you know, what can you do about it? Like, these devices are just so, so locked down these days. You know, there's no, there aren't good alternatives to this. You know, it's unfortunately the type of thing where government regulation is probably one of your few options, you know, and ultimately, like, this is an antitrust issue. Okay, uh, one last question, and I wouldn't make this so long, or I wouldn't have made this so long if I <laughs> enjoy it. 
because I feel like I have learned a lot and this was maybe selfish, but there's a lot of discussion in regards to the difference between VPN and Tor. And sometimes people recommend that you should use both at the same time. What is your take? Depends on your threat model, but certainly using both can be uh, the more secure option. You know, like Tor has a different, Tor is a different type of uh, threat model than VPNs. It also depends a lot on like what VPN you use, right? You know, like I personally use a Mulvad because I've personally met the people behind Mulvad and I've talked to them about their philosophy and, you know, their business model. And it's reasonably convincing to me that they, their business model probably is just being a VPN and selling privacy, right? Whereas like a lot of other VPNs, probably their real business model is, especially, you know, anyone that's free as an example, their real business model is very likely to be selling uh, logs. You know, Tor has this issue, although its architecture is different because Tor, of course, is run by a nonprofit you know, run like ultimately in large part funded by the U.S. government. And at least if your threat isn't the U.S. government, for a lot of reasons, Tor is probably pretty trustworthy. And even if your threat is the U.S. government, Tor seems to work pretty well. Yeah, I've actually heard about embassies running Tor, which is interesting. Yeah. Well, like, like remember, the U.S. government needs Tor to exist for a variety of reasons. Um, part of its regime change, part of it's for their own internal people to use it. And for all these reasons, having Tor actually work and actually get used by a ton of people helps them out. So it's really no surprise that, you know, you get that funding source. You know, and it's not exactly a hidden thing. I mean, they're quite open about it. And it's been true for ages. But... I think the the bigger one is more just the VPN market where it's pretty clear that a lot of VPN services are really sketchy. Yeah, you know, it's just it's just the nature of the thing. Like you can undercut your competitors on price by making money selling logs. Do you think that we should be running Tor exit nodes just like we run Bitcoin nodes? Well, in theory, yes, but uh, have fun doing that. Like the the unfortunate thing is depending on your jurisdiction, like you can get in a lot of trouble for running a Tor exit node. You know, the Tor has a good set of guidelines to try to do it, but it's the kind of thing where it's not something you really want to recommend people do just willy nilly. On the other hand, running Tor routing nodes, that is not the exit nodes, but the inner nodes, that's totally fine in nearly anywhere. And, uh, you know, I'd recommend people do that. I mean, I've done that for myself quite a few times. So plus you don't need exit nodes to use Tor. Like Tor is Bitcoin support as, as an example, doesn't need exit nodes to work. So having more bandwidth on the Tor network, um, for inner routing nodes helps everyone. Okay. That's good to know. Really? Oh, thank you. So thank you for doing this interview. I know you don't do a lot of podcasts. I know it's pretty difficult to get you. And I'm happy, (laughs) fortunate to have you for these two hours. Well, it's it's easy to try. Just send me an email. Whether or not I respond, well, we'll see. (laughs) Yeah. And I suppose I will be seeing you in Romania, hopefully, this year. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I hope to go back to um, uh, the Transylvania conference. It's, it was a lot of fun last year. Yeah. So thank you very much, Peter. Do you have any closing words or anything that you want to promote? No, just uh, thank you. Okay. I'll send you this when it's over, when I finish editing. All right. Thanks. Let's hear a few words from the show's sponsors. LXMI is a European cryptocurrency exchange whose name is inspired by Lakshmi, the Hindu goddess of wealth, good fortune, and prosperity. It's one of the regulated and legal cryptocurrency exchanges. On LXMI, you can buy bitcoins with most fiat currencies, and you can also do trading with top altcoins. 
They follow the not your keys, not your Bitcoin's philosophy with their integrated non-custodial wallet, which helps you manage your own private keys. So if you're into trading, then you don't have to worry about having your crypto frozen by whatever political decisions, since you're empowered to hold and move your coins whenever you wish. It's great to have new players like LXMI that respect your financial sovereignty. LXMI is launching in 2020, and for more information, please check out lxmi.io. If you're not into trading, it's recommended to move your coins to a hardware wallet or some other form of cold storage, and in this episode, you're about to find out why. Please keep in mind that this is just an ad for a sponsor of the show. It's not meant to serve as financial advice, and you're responsible to do your own research before buying anything and act according to your own decisions. Embrace your financial sovereignty with agency and precaution. Femex is a Bitcoin exchange with derivative trading options, which focuses on speed, robustness, and maximum uptime. Built by former Morgan Stanley executives, it manages to bring simple and accessible Bitcoin trading. In 2020, Femex will also add S&P 500 stocks, stock indexes, Forex, commodities, and more. Sign up today at femex.com slash bonus and receive a bonus of up to $72. Please keep in mind that this is just an ad for a sponsor of this show. It's not meant to serve as financial advice. and You're responsible to do your own research before buying anything and act according to your own decisions. Embrace your financial sovereignty with agency and precaution. <laughs>